Welcome to the last afternoon sessions of this conference. Uh, I'm Mohsen Rosabe, I'm chairing the last two sessions. And our first speaker is Barry Sanders from the University of Calgary, and he will be speaking about practical long distance quantum communications. Okay, thanks. Um, there are mics, but I think I won't figure it out. I'm just going to talk loudly. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. So I don't need a mic then. All right, it, so it's a great pleasure to be able to speak here. As Boston said, I'm at University of Calgary, but in fact, I'm also here. I have an office just over there. So I'm a USDC professor on the Chenren Jihua. And, uh, worked. Okay, and uh, I'd like to talk about some work, and this work has been done largely over here with a collaborator of mine, Aisha Khali, who spent time uh, here at USDC. And uh, we've been working on this long distance modeling program. And then recently we've had some more results. So I'll have a slide with some results that we're just getting out today. Um, and two of the students here, uh, Yashang and Peng Ching, are, are sitting there. And so they've been contributing <coughs> results. And I'll get to the latest stuff. OK, let me just tell you what the project's about so you're clear. And you can decide if it's interesting or not. The um, idea here is to consider long distance quantum communication quantum key distribution, et cetera, and we just want to model it. So it's not like it's a hard theoretical problem. Uh, and we had, you know, the first talk, we heard things about models of uh, QKD. And so we're just taking the theory, we write down, from the theory, we write down the mathematics, and then we want to solve it numerically. But as Carl Cave said, Hilbert space is big. It's really big. So when we try to model things, uh, the modeling doesn't, um, doesn't work well because we have summations over a huge number of dimensions. So the goal of this project is to be able to write down the theories of how a QKD system is behaving and then be able to solve the mathematics to get results and the goal is to get accurate results. So the answers we get should agree with experiment. And we've been working on this for a few years and there's a few more years to go to get everything sorted and I'll tell you where we're at. Okay, um, the recent work with Aisha, that's published in uh, three papers, Fisra of A, two in Fisra of A, and one in uh, Journal of Optical Society of America B. And the re result tends to be technical, so we often aim for archival type journals because we're building up all these results. Okay, the motivation, of course, is long distance quantum communication. We heard at the very beginning of this conference some of the goals here in China to develop long distance quantum communication systems satellite-based, ground-based, and again, we're interested in modeling those. I have some results here on, uh, it's not a good survey, but it's just a few uh, of the long-distance quantum key distribution efforts, and again, the goal is to try to model these. The basic idea here is we're working on the entanglement swapping based approach. Of course, eventually we want to start incorporating realistic descriptions of quantum memory. That's where the field is going. But with uh, entanglement swapping, we have a simple system. Each of these green dots represents parametric down conversion. So that's photon pair production. That infinity is really tying together entanglement. So this source should produce pairs of photons. This source should produce pairs of photons. One photon from each one goes to a Bell state measurement. The Bell state measurement has a measurement result conditioned on that um, we then get a result for entanglement. In fact, Suzanne from Delft talked about that early in the conference, the entanglement swapping phase scheme. What we wish happened, but it doesn't, is that we would take source, it would yield a bell state. So if we could, we would love to get two photons out every time we push a button, and it would happen at the same time in both. And then once we plug it through all the mathematics, we just get some entangled bell state. And then if we project onto the BC case, we figure out what state we have and uh, project onto an entangled state over A and D. That would be the hope. The reality is that the parametric down converter has, it has a probability of having nothing in the output, a probability of a pair, a probability of two pairs, and so on. The detectors have dark counts, inefficiency, et cetera. So that's, um, that reality is what we're, one of the things that we're including. So if we take into account that the pair is not really producing 
uh, fo the PDC is not producing single uh, photon pairs right away, but rather can have vacuum in two pairs and so on, we can write the, um, we can just describe it by a pure state where we exponentiate creation operators. So that would create <coughs> horizontally polarized photons in the A and B mode, and then we can create vertically polarized photons in the A and B modes, act on the vacuum, and then we can just write this exponential acting on the vacuum. Um, we, when we do things, we do two different approaches to dealing with this. Mathematically, when we solve all the problems, we can write very nice expressions in terms of confluent hypergeometrics and things that every mathematical physicist gets excited by. If, on the other hand, programming-wise, numerical, we're starting to move towards um, rules and uh, techniques so that we're, we're developing programs that would just generate all the events, all the states and everything in, in a computerized way that doesn't rely on the math. So we have two different approaches. Then we take into account the realistic part of the channel. And this uh, represents the channel loss. Alpha naught is the loss built into the components of the channel. And alpha is the uh, decay rate. This is usually measured in dB per kilometer. <coughs> and so we could think of optical fiber, but a similar expression holds for free space. And then we have the detector. And so we model the detector so far in a simple way. It turns out that our conceptual way of doing it agrees mathematically with uh, result by Rohde and Ralph that was published several years ago in Journal of Modern Optics. And the way that we describe the detector in our, in our uh, model is we just think of a signal field coming in. We have a thermal field, but the thermal field is not really the temperature of the, of the room. It's an artificial temperature that's meant to produce dark counts. And then there's a beam splitter that takes into account channel loss and detector loss. And so some of the light goes here. and the other light goes in here. We treat the detector as a projector. And we have a dark count rate. And the artificial temperature is chosen so that that expression involving inefficiency and temperature <coughs> and frequency yields the dark count rate in the formula. Later, I'll mention some results where we also take into account that detectors have a biasing where you can trade off efficiency and dark count. So I'll, I'll mention that later. Sometimes. With the detector, you want to optimize some of the settings. OK, and then the mathematical expression is here. Once you plug all that in, you get the Rohde and Ralph expression for the probability. And this would be, I would represent an ideal case, that if your detector were perfect, it would see I photons. This is the probability a detector sees nothing, given that I photons impinge on it. And of course, it depends on dark counts that create false counts and losses where you don't see the photon you want to see. So we plug that in. In entanglement swapping, we have four detectors. And you'll see this expression come up again. But that conditional probability for four detectors, all four detectors behave independently. So that expression just factorizes into a product of uh, probabilities for different detectors. So here's the, um, the entanglement swapping for photons. And here you can see the parametric down converter, two cases of it. This is the Bell state measurement as it's the concept as it's implemented in the experiment. So here's a beam splitter. Then there's polarizing beam splitters that separate, say, horizontal and vertical. There are four detectors, and they yield a result QRST. So after taking into account all the bad stuff, there's a result QRST from those four detectors. And based on those, there's an inference of whether um, the state that Alice and Bob hold is appropriate or not. So I've just done the ideal case here. Assuming everything is ideal, if QRST yields 1010 or 0101, in the ideal case, you can infer that it's the Bell state psi plus between Alice and Bob. If you get these counts, you infer it's psi minus. And with linear optics, there's always the problem you can't discriminate all four Bell states. So you get Phi plus, a mixture of phi plus and phi minus based on those counts. So then we can post select based on these and say that we have that Bell state. OK, but things then get a bit more complicated. And so what's really going on, actually, let me just tell you conceptually, is that what goes on in a statistical sense is there's some reading there, and then there's a resultant state there. 
And so if we abstract that, we want to know what is, what are the conditional probabilities? You know, given that we see this, what do we get here? So I just abstract it, and then this Q corresponds to a conditional probability of counts at the outer detectors. This is what Alice and Bob hold. Just go back for a moment. Um, so that's Q prime, R prime, S prime, T prime. So what are those values conditioned on inner values, Q, R, S, T, and take into account the chi parameter, which is the strength of the pump of the parametric down converter, the dark count rate, and the loss rate. And then in an experiment, what we care about is what's known as the two-photon visibility. So if we can figure out the visibility, we can use it to assess the performance of the quantum communication, and we can use it to um, determine key rates and so on. OK, so we have, well, that's the laser pointer. Which button? Okay, good. So, um, so then if we know that visibility, we can assess the performance of quantum communication, key rate, and so on. And so this is Q extremum, and then that Q is just evaluated. <laughs> my talk. You're, you're gonna sink the device. I don't want anything like that, thanks. <laughs> but I appreciate, I appreciate trying. So, yeah. uh, so then, um, what we have is the extrema over all possible counts here, Q prime, S prime, T prime, whatever. The visibility is just max minus min over max plus min of those coincident, of those conditional detections. And then we can start plotting it, and this just gives you an idea of the kind of plots. So this would be the two photon visibility between Alice and Bob, where we assume uh, uh, no losses in the detectors. We have a weak parametric down conversion, so the multi-photon rate is small, no dark counts, no constant loss in the system, and a loss of, say, 0.25 dB per kilometer. And then after plotting it, you can just see a visibility that is never quite one, even if there's no separation between Alice and Bob, and a nice curve that saturates as L goes out. So this could be like 3,000 kilometers. There's some saturation in the visibility in this case. OK, now, um, <coughs> mathematically, What's going on is as follows. So there's the two parametric down converters. They each produce that chi, which was that exponential acting on the vacuum. We have a product. Then in entanglement swapping, there's a beam splitter. And the inner beam splitter produces a state that I just referred to as C. And then the detector, if it's ideal, performs a Fock projection. And so that pi is a projection operator. N is the inner detectors for the entanglement swapping, IJKL is the ideal count rate acting on C, and then we normalize by a probability that takes into account the projected state itself is not normalized, and I'll define that to be C tilde outer IJKL. So this would be, this <coughs> represents the idea that if you make certain counts on the inner, then um, you infer an outer state. So this is the outer state that we wish were the Bell state. And we, so, for the good quantum communication, that should be a good result. And then we take the outer state, and then we take into account noisy detection. And then when we take into account noisy detection, we have a probability of an ideal count, IJKL, given QRST on the inner detectors, acting on that ideal state. So we're essentially performing an averaging over the fact that detectors are noisy. Uh, noisy. And then what you can see here is we're starting to build up a Bayesian description of what's going on. So Ultimately, we start using Bayesian methods to figure out what's happening in the system. And then here, the rope QRST, that should be a lowercase, uh, is then calculatable. So if we want to calculate all this, we can do it mathematically. We have here the um, state. We have polarizer rotators in the system. This is what Alice and Bob control. And then when we calculate that, we can get all those expressions. What's delta? So, sorry? Delta? Delta is one of the two polarizer settings. Oh. So Alice controls, actually, the notation's going to change later. Sorry, but, yeah. So Bob controls delta, Bob turns delta, Alice controls alpha, and then they set their polarizers to maximize their count rate. Um, we can write everything mathematically. So as I said at the start, you know, the theory takes a bit of effort. You just write it all down, and we can incorporate other stuff. The problem is that the Hilbert spaces are infinite dimensional, 
And so we can write a mathematical expression, but once we put all this junk in, we, it's not that easy to solve. So that's the point. So here's the Bayesian approach. We have, this is a probability of ideal counts conditioned on actual counts. And the Bayesian method allows you to invert that. So we need to know this quantity. And by doing that Bayesian approach and taking into account that all four detectors are independent, we can factorize them. And then we compute that quantity. We're able then to use a Bayesian technique. All these ones are not hard to calculate, but these tend to be very difficult. So evaluating these, mathematically, we have to truncate the Hilbert space to evaluate the sums. And so uh, these techniques either take a huge amount of computational power, we have to truncate the Hilbert space, and we don't always, we can't tell what the errors are. So the truncation leads to unknown errors. And this is what we're trying to address. And then here, once we get all those right, this is the conditional, the Q, the coincidence rate, or the the visibility or the coincidence rate at the outer detectors that Alice and Bob hold condition on the actual. So if it, you're an experimentalist and this were a good model, that's the expression you want. You want to say, given that I have this, these counts registered in the entanglement swapping chain, what do I have on the outer? OK, so that's, uh, that kind of tells us what we need to do. This graph gives you an idea of the sort of computations we care about. So in order to assess how good an experiment is, we want to see what is the visibility. And then we might ask questions. We say, uh, if we have our visibility, maybe we should turn up the parametric down conversion <coughs> pump, or we should turn it down. So this kind of expression tells you how the visibility depends on whether you're willing to get more multi-photon events or fewer and trade off the vacuum. Um, and so these expressions allow us to assess visibility versus some parameter. These are different categories depending on the loss rate. These depend on the dark count rate. And later, as I said, in detectors, you can have a trade-off. You can There's some relation between those two quantities. But we have these, and they allow us to assess performance. This could be useful in the future if uh, long-distance quantum key distribution is useful and we had good models. It would help us make choices, like where we put repeater stations, what power settings, what kind of instruments we put in. So these kinds of results could be useful in the future where we have to make design choices, you know, make decisions where to put resources, and we need a good model to help us decide. Okay. I've talked about the ordinary single, the vanilla flavored uh, single swap. This is what we're much more interested in here, is the multi-swap case. And in the multi-swap case, uh, we can consider uh, entanglement swapping. So here's Alice to five. So there's an entanglement swapping through a Bell state measurement, and so on. This, there's a swap here, a swap to here, a swap to here. And so <coughs> five, six, seven are intermediate between swaps. These are the Bell state measurements going on, then further Bell state measurements. So this scheme gives you an idea how we would do a long range entanglement swap. Yeah. Do, do, do you do it in a binary tree structure or more linearly? Well, this is. Uh, li or does it make a difference? Doesn't make a difference because all, from a Bayesian sense, all we care is you lay it out in that pattern, and then you gather data here, and then you want to do an inference of what Alice and Bob were. So, uh, yeah, we're not using any sophisticated um, ordering techniques. Okay, so this gives you an idea of the long range effect, and the Bayesian stuff comes in by uh, by conditioning on the inner results. Okay, now this, the mathematics gets complicated. I'm not going to go through the details. I'll just give you an idea. But when we start doing it, and we, if we solve it mathematically, we want to know relations. So just on the next page, it's telling us how these counts depend on those counts. So there's some formula here. And the formula might not look nice to you, but to me, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's got the product of two combinatorics and the minus sign. So it has the right feeling of a particular parameter choice in a hypergeometric function. So if you're like I am and you wake up in the morning and think of hypergeometrics, it's, it's a beautiful thing to use. OK, so I share it. This is the thing. This is, <laughs> this is also a beautiful thing. OK, so these are the kinds of calculations we do. And these are nested sums. And so I don't want to go through the expression. I want to give you a feeling for what the problem is. So these things, these i, j, k, l are bold face, which means they're vectors. And so you can see subscripts on ijkl. So these 
This is summed over all counts of all detectives to evaluate an expression. And each of these sums goes to infinity. So we can get nested sums where like, we can have um, uh, I don't know, 33 nested sums with Hilbert spaces of four or five dimensions each. And there's no hope that any computer ever will solve it. So we have a beautiful expression that tells us everything, but we can't solve the expression. So until now, what we do is we truncate the sum. So we limit it, and then we get expressions. And that's allowed us to simulate under these conditions. Thank you. Under these conditions, um, a few swaps. But once we go beyond about three swaps, things don't work out very well anymore. So the question that we're trying to address now is how to perform, how to evaluate such sums in the best possible way. And we have two approaches that I'll explain and, and two students here uh, considering it. But first I'll just go back to a graph and give you an idea. These are, by the way, these are examples we get. So we're able to solve the expression very well. For example, n equals 3. So this would be Alice and Bob separated by three entanglement swap stations. These are the conditional coincidences of outer counts versus inner counts. This is um, how uh, the detector would be set. And Jill, this is that when you asked before, this was alpha earlier, this was delta. So now I, uh, we change it, but I forgot to change the earlier slide. So these are just functions of detector settings, and we find that we want to set the detector at time two. So this is just a phase where Alice and Bob go through to calibrate and then set their relative phases. And these are various parameters, and we get these kinds of results. And then from those, we can take max and min and calculate visibility. And then from those expressions out to n equals three swaps, we're able to do calculations, for example, the visibility and how it falls with chi. So if you do an experiment out to some large distance, and we find that we can get out to a few hundred, 800 kilometers. Um, yeah, but <laughs> so in, in the scheme, so easy for the Pardon me? So easy for the It's easy for, well, it's easy for an experimentalist too, but I'll tell you the downside. So the upside is that you get out to about 800 kilometers. The problem is that the count rate is roughly 10 times, you have to wait 10 times the age of the universe oh. for, <laughs> for each count. So, uh, so the, yeah, so basically the message is it's easy for an experimentalist, you just have to be patient. <laughs> okay, but the math works. This is kind of um, the argument that we need quantum memory. So we're getting very good results, but uh, we need quantum memory to get past that slow rate. And then we're able to calculate the visibility versus the length for different cases. And there's kind of interesting lessons here. These would all be in kilometers. And then we find n equals 1, 2, 3. You find it short distance. You want one swap. As you go to further, two swaps is better than one. If you want long distance, three. So Fewer swap stations is better, um, but eventually they fail. And then more swaps helps. And this keeps going out. So we expect uh, that we can increase the number of swaps and go out to large distances, but at a terrible uh, count rate. OK, once we use all that, we're able to plug it into the quantum key distribution approach. <coughs> and so over here, this is the quantum relay-based system with multiple entanglement swapping stations count rates that come up, condition detection, and when we calculate these, um, plugging in the short press scale rate, the simple key rate, calculating all these various expressions, we're able then to assess not just the visibility, but by straightforward techniques, what the key rate would be. And when we do it, um, we can then study the key rate. Uh, where we look at the rate, we, we consider what is the optimum value of the pump strength for the parametric down converter to generate the highest key rate. We can consider, I mentioned before, this is a typical trade-off formula between dark counts and efficiency. So for an uh, in-gas detector, we plug in A and B, and then we can consider what is the optimal bias strength on the detector to trade off between dark counts and efficiency. So we're able to do all these kinds of things. That's kind of the long-term aim is that design issue. And we're also able to take cases and compare to the TGW bound Takeuka Guha Wilde bound, which has been mentioned at this meeting. In this case, instead of having higher order of counts, we consider the single photon source idealized. We make the dark count zero efficiency perfect, plug in this loss, and then we're able to check how our description compares, and we're finding close to the TGW bound. So we understand now um, 
we're, we're getting a very good idea of what the roles are of dark counts in, uh, and other practical problems that do it. So we're starting to understand better what is that gap and how does it come about. And that helps us understand how uh, quantum key distribution is uh, approaching a bosonic channel bound. OK, and then finally, for the result, uh, and I'm leaving lots of time for questions because I like, uh, we want feedback. So this slide is what we're about to do. This is all done today in the slide I'll give you tomorrow. So in the last 24 hours, we're starting to get some good results. This approach, so um, Yashiong and Hong Chang are just in the second row back there. And so the approach here is saying, OK, we're not going to solve these mathematical problems. They're too hard with these nested sums. Why don't we borrow a page from, say, particle physics and condensed matter physics and start using a Monte Carlo simulation? So here, this goes back to the thing that we want to know. What is the probability of detections by Alice and Bob conditioned on inner practical detections? We write this using our Bayesian formulation. And then these expressions aren't hard to construct. But the hard part is getting the probability of actual counts on the inside. That huge expression that I wrote down gave you the mathematical way to do it, but it's not tractable. So instead, what we did before is we truncate our Hilbert space. You can see that domain as a 4 by 2 n minus 1 dimension hypercube. So we essentially restrict the domain to a hypercube in a high, high, a high tensor product of Hilbert spaces. Instead, we've gone now to a Metropolis Hastings sampling approach, which I don't have time to discuss. But we're now using Metro Metropolis Hastings technique Monte Carlo methods to, to get that. And we're checking whether it's consistent with our previous results. And we're getting good consistency, as seen in these Q plots. Um, we're doing 2 to the 17 samples per point. We're seeing the error bars. But this technique of sampling could allow us to make error an input. We could say don't to the computer, don't stop until you give us the answer with this accuracy. So on the one hand, we think that we can solve much bigger entanglement swapping. On the other hand, we should be able to say what the error bars in our sample. So that's very useful. And I'll stop, just put up the conclusion so I can stop here. Thanks. For a couple of questions for Barry. I'm going to ask myself questions if nobody else does. <laughs> I have a little question. I don't know how relevant this is to, to the job. Would be interesting in some cases to study correlated noise in the model of the detectors. Like, uh, so you had this thermal radiation in the modeling of the detector entering. Uh, so in every detector had an independent thermal state. Uh, Sorry, just a moment. Yeah, this is fine. Sorry, yeah. So any correlated noise. Yeah, would it be interesting or is it just not? Well, I think that's a, so, so to me, um, everything is interesting if an experimentalist tells me it's relevant. And we're blessed with people. So maybe I'll just ask. Like, so, so Julia was asking about whether it would be interesting to study with correlated noise of detectors. Anybody think the answer is yes? Anybody think the answer is no? Anybody heard his question? <laughs> the question is whether. Yeah, so I did a factorization of the probability for the detectors, right? So I factorized it. I think what Julia was saying is, would it be interesting actually to consider that detectors could have correlated noises? And then I'm asking the experimentalists in the room if that's interesting and what we answer. There are flashes of light that from the ground light that be. So it's interesting. <laughs> I haven't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you get my answer is if if an experimentalist says it's interesting, I will build it in. In the lab. Okay, good. So, in the lab, I talk about Liang and Jian, where you talk about different generations of repeaters. We try to integrate with uh, another from error correction and talk. Do you think some of these methods can be adapted to treat some of those cases as well? Uh, so, which which particular, like, so which noise processing? So, here the entanglement swapping is always probabilistic. But there are other repeater architectures where you try to make entanglement swapping deterministic. Oh, oh, I get you. Yeah. By using air correcting codes. Yeah, 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 definitely. Okay. So, so far, this is kind of a toy problem. 
where we find out that the key rate is, um, the, you know, the age of the universe is not even long enough to generate a bit. So obviously we have a problem. The techniques you're talking about by deterministic methods, there's quantum memory, um, various various methods, absolutely. So the priority now, once once we get this sampling done, so we're able to solve problems with these giant sums, the next priority is exactly what you said. It's you know like how many papers can we write about um, a accurate sampling where rates are you know rates are terrible with respect to the age of the universe, and what you're saying is what we need to do next. So I guess also if you have less probabilistic events in your scheme, it also becomes easier to sample. Right? Um, you also, can, in some of the are probabilistic. Well, so yes, if you turn chi down, so the multi-photon rate goes down. If you truncate, it gets better and better. The problem is, you can then ask, how does that scale with the length of the system where your entanglement swapping stations are never very high, right? So even with a smaller chi, the multi-photon effects are going to grow in importance. So you're right for a few swaps. But if you just ask more mathematically, what happens is you get longer and longer, it will scale badly. It's just you can push it further. Okay, thank you. It's just time for one very quick question. Now let's thank the speaker again.